Yeah. Right, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for sticking around to the very last talk. Um, I'm going to talk about the relationship between form and function in the saber tooth cranial skeleton and its possible variation through time and space. And saber tooths probably belong to one of the most iconic fossils on par with the usual suspects of Tyrannosaurus or the apparently boring mammoths. So they're instantly recognized by many um, hands for uh, a smile on here has received considerable academic and public attention, has been featured heavily in popular science and non-scientific media. However, this popularity of this single specimen, or the single species, I should say, um, has considerably clouded the true diversity of saber-toothed vertebrates. And in fact, if we look at saber-toothed vertebrates through time, a butler again. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I hope so. Um, so yes, if we look, for example, at the cat family alone and the cats, we have three instances of uh, different saber-toothed groups. If we move outside of the cats, we have at least two families, uh, two groups of uh, different saber-toothed. Within the cat family, we have the most recent example, the most plio and Pleistocene, and you can see there's a considerable overlap both in time and space, whereas those groups outside of the cat family are pushing back towards the Eocene and the Oligocene. And if we look further outside of Mammalia, we have at least one example of a saber-toothed marsupial, probably a few more, but the fossil record is quite uh, patchy here. So with Thalacus malus from South America, we have at least one prominent example. And if we move uh, about 200 million years further back, uh, we have another group of uh, non-mammalian synapsids with this quite species and diverse group of Gorgonopsians. So we have at least six, probably seven large groups of uh, saber-toothed vertebrates. So this is uh, quite a remarkable instance of uh, convergent evolution. And if we look at uh, the different saber-toothed characteristics uh, across these different groups here exemplified by individual tax or the cranial skeleton of these individual tax, we see that we have typical saber-toothed characteristics. Obviously, the prominent and eponymous uh, uh, canine teeth, saber-like canine teeth, which are variably uh, exaggerated in these different groups. But we have other features like the very high and anterior, posteriorly compressed brain case. If we look at the lower jaw, we have uh, very prominently here this mental process in many taxa, um, and at the same time, a very reduced coronate process. So we see a mix or a mosaic fashion of uh, these uh, characters distributed over these different groups and these different taxa. And that led to the question uh, we wanted to ask basically, um, does this morphological convergence also indicate that we have functional convergence? Or in very simple terms, just because all these taxa look very similar, does that mean they function in the same way? And can we therefore infer the same behavior and the same hunting or killing style? And the further question we had is that if we see the expression of these saber tooth characteristics through time and through phylogeny, do we see convergent trends? So do we see parallel trends from the most basal to the most derived taxa in each of these groups? And we wanted to test that by looking at different functional performance criteria, such as the gape angle, the mandibular stability, and the bite force. And the conventional way how we would tackle that problem is obviously with um, three-dimensional biomechanical analysis using digital models. But you've seen the sheer diversity of saber-toothed vertebrates, so we are close to 100 different taxa. Um, obviously, using 3D models and computational biomechanics requires extensive access to specimens, to digitization uh, technology, time for digitization, mostly time for digital restoration and reconstruction, given that we have to remove taphonomic artifacts. So basically, in a best case scenario, this takes about two to four weeks per specimen. With 100 specimens, we're close to 100 months here. So, or if you want to put that in grant terms, 
that would take up to three standard grants just to digitize these models. So we've taken a simplified approach of using these replicated 2D models. So basically the third dimension, the medial lateral dimension is reduced here to a fraction of its size. And what we're considering is only the lateral outline, both of the skull and lower jaw. Um, that obviously has several ramifications, how these results can be obtained and also how um, these results should be evaluated. But I'll get to that uh, when we look closer at the different performance criteria throughout this talk. Uh, performance criteria, let's start with the gape angle. So obviously if the canines grow larger, the lower jaw has to open wider so that we can actually accommodate the space, the clearance between the canines. Um, measuring maximum gape angle, this is based on a method uh, I developed uh, a couple of years ago, basically looking at uh, muscle extension factors. So the way this works is uh, using a digital model, in this case, again, Smilodon, the lower jaw is opened in a stepwise fashion and the muscles, the jaw muscles are stretched and the relationship between the resting length of the muscle and the stretch length is calculated. And as soon as that reaches a critical limit, which is about 170% uh, of its resting length, then the muscle turns red, indicated here with these bars and the muscles here, and then the whole opening cycle stops. And that gives me the overall maximum gape. For 2D models, obviously, that is a bit different. Works in the same fashion, but obviously the maximum, maximum gape is a lot smaller because we're missing that third component, that third dimension. So the muscles are a lot shorter than if we had the medial lateral component added to that. Because we're using a comparative approach, that wouldn't necessarily be a problem because we're comparing magnitudes or gape angles between taxa using the same uh, approach but we're still interested how far off are we here uh, with the 2D models in comparison to the 3D models. We had some 3D models of uh, Sabertooth um, available. So these three taxa from different groups and also we used um, two extant carnivores, a lion and a spotted hyena and we compared the differences in gape angle between these different taxa, both using 2D and 3D models. We see we're somewhere around a factor of two where we're off with the gape angle. The whole thing can be calculated also mathematically uh, using average dimensions of the saber tooth skull and using trigonometry. And very nicely, we get to a very, very similar correction factor. So uh, we're off about a factor of two using these 2D models in comparison to 3D models. Results look like this. Um, so gape angle here on the y-axis, uh, time or respectively the different taxa here along the x-axis. And we see that gape angle generally increases, although with different slopes and the different taxa, very clearly here in these earlier groups. But as soon as we get to the saber tooth cats and the spatial and temporal overlap here, we see those three groups are doing something completely different. Just keep that in mind. Um, I should mention the solid lines are obviously the absolute gape angle. The dotted lines are the effective gape angle. So that is basically the clearance between the canines, which means that this could be different if the teeth grow larger or longer than the gape angle can accommodate, then we get different results. So in the Gorgonopsians, this is actually the case. The teeth outgrow the gape opening so that we have actually a decrease in effective jaw gape. The next performance criteria we looked at was mandibular stability. And uh, this we would usually test with uh, 3D FEA. Um, again, we're using a simplified approach of using 2D models, basically with a very, very small medial lateral width, about 3% of the length standardized to all models. And we see we get fairly close in terms of the contour plots of the stress distribution between the 2D and 3D models. Just by eyeballing, that looks quite good. But we also wanted to have a few more quantifiable results. So here uh, plotted, this is average stress for the 2D and 3D models, 3D models in orange, 2D in blue. And we see, although we don't get the absolute same magnitudes with 2D as we would with 3D, 
we get the same pattern. So in a comparative approach, we're still getting meaningful, meaningful results um, given the differences between different taxa. And again, here results uh, plotted in the same fashion. So in this case, uh, here on the y-axis, this is bending strength, so the higher, the better. And again, we see generally an increase in bend bending strength in the earlier groups. And again, as soon as we get to the saber-toothed cats, we see all three of them are doing things absolutely oppositely. So we get uh, variability here, an increase and decrease in bending resistance, similar to the gape angle. And finally, we looked at bite force. So again, using FEA, this time not just loading the mandible uh, as a simple uh, load force, but actually with projected muscle loads here at the respective muscle attachment sites. Again, we compared that to the 2D models and 3D models for all five taxa. Looking at the contour plots just uh, qualitatively and also quantitatively shown here. And what was interesting for us is the bite efficiency. So basically the ratio between input muscle force and output bite force, basically that's an indicator how efficient muscle forces can be used and transferred into bite force. And that, to my own surprise, came out very, very close between 2D and 3D models. So we're uh, partially only less than a percent off here. So this is a good indicator that we are getting very close with our results with the 2D models. If we look at our results here, a slightly different pattern to the ones before. Uh, instead of a general increase in our performance uh, measures, we get either a fairly flat line or even a decrease in bite force. Um, I should mention again, these three saber tooth cat groups are doing everything separately. But it is a bit counterintuitive. Why would a group of highly specialized uh, predators decrease bite force? And that is actually um, related to the feeding or hunting behavior, or at least the currently assumed uh, style, the so-called canine shear bite. So in this case, the lower jaw is used to anchor itself into the prey item, and then rather than using the jaw muscles to clamp the jaw shut, the neck muscles are used basically to pivot the skull around the condyle and drive the sabers into the prey item. So therefore, main focus or main muscle force coming from the neck muscles rather than the jaw muscles. And therefore, it's quite realistic that we have a decrease in bite efficiency as these muscle groups are not really used in the killing bite. As we've seen, um, there are different trends. If we look at the individual um, performance criteria, if we look at all criteria together in this function space, we see there's a large overlap here. Um, with the convex hulls, we see the gorgonopsins here in blue are a bit more experimental, pushing that uh, function space further out. But generally, if we look at all three performance criteria, we are getting a large overlap. So looking at all criteria doesn't give us really an accurate picture of what's happening. If we compare morphology and function, so in this case, looking at the jaw morphology here as a PCA plot and superimposed onto that uh, the heat map for these performance criteria only shown for the gape and the bending resistance, but also bite force looks pretty much the same. What we see with the convex hulls that we have not really a clear uh, differentiation between these different groups in terms of jaw morphology. However, what we have is these two hotspots nicely separated. Uh, these are the maximum values, maximum magnitudes for these different performance criteria. And if we actually look at uh, what shape or what morphology uh, puts into that, we see that we are separated between these two morphologies. So one mandibular morphology where we have these large metal processes and the reduced uh, coronoids and the more cat-like morphology with the convex symphysis and the large coronoids. Um, so we're splitting morphology between these two, um, not necessarily in a progressive or evolutionary fashion. So through phylogeny within all groups, 
moves back and forth between these two morphologies. So this is um, the only morphology which is explored. And as you can see, we have a large empty space in between that. And with that, I'll briefly sum up what uh, we've seen with these trends. So we have clear indication that we have uh, trends in terms of these three uh, performance criteria. We have increase in gape angle, we have an increase in bending resistance and a decrease in the bite efficiency. However, if we look at all three parameters in combination, we see not a clear separation. They're all superimposed onto each other. But what we can see, and that's something we want to explore a bit further, is that we have these three, especially these three saber-tooth cat groups. Uh, they are showing different trends, and that is likely due to possible niche partitioning or uh, different ecologies, which triggers these opposite trends, given the spatial and temporal overlap. And with that, I'll thank you all for your attention. And if we have time for questions, I'm happy to answer those.